I also want to start by thanking the University of Chicago, EPIC, uh, the Martin School at Oxford, and our friends at the American Council on Capital Formation for uh, organizing this, uh, this really interesting event. When uh, we and EPIC started talking about this uh, now more than a year ago, you know, the, our sort of thesis was, you know, everyone, all these economists always say we need two things in clean energy. We need some kind of a pull policy to bring new, you know, clean energy into the market, and we need R&D. And then they spend all their time analyzing the pull policies. So there, there are you know, volumes that you can fill about the proper form for cap and trade policies and carbon taxes and clean energy standards, and actually relatively little work about how you do research and development well, that kind of black box we call innovation. And so we wanted to have an event that focused and went more deeply uh, into discussing what are some of the best practices in innovation, what are some of the advice and lessons that we can learn for this generation of policymakers. Clearly, in Congress, they've expressed significant bipartisan support for this as an issue, but is the right thing to do just to keep putting more money into the same engine and apparatus, or should we be thinking about finding new ways to do it and do it better, get higher ROI out of those resources? Um, so uh, again, I'm Rich Powell. I'm from the Clear Path Foundation. Uh, we focus on uh, advancing conservative policies that accelerate clean energy uh, innovation. We have a vision where America leads the world to a clean, reliable, affordable uh, uh, power system, uh, which then helps to decarbonize the rest of the world. Uh, and I'm very lucky to be joined here by three uh, very thoughtful folks who have thought a lot about innovation in various sectors. And so I'm going to start from that end with the introductions, and then we'll do the first round of comments the other way. So uh, first, we have Bill Brown. Uh, he's the CEO of NetPower, which is working with Exelon and McDermott to commercialize zero emission gas power technology known as the Alum Cycle that may allow the world to meet all of its climate targets at electricity prices the entire world can afford. Sort of turns things on its head. If you are not already excited about the alum cycle, I hope you leave this discussion today very excited about the alum cycle. Uh, I think it's one of the most interesting things going on in the space. In addition to that, and the other perspective Bill will bring is that he's also the co-founder of Eight Rivers Capital. They're the inventor of the alum cycle, but they also explore new technologies in a number of other sectors and spaces, like space and telecommunications. Uh, and Bill has a long record of investing in other things like pharmaceuticals as well. And so we hope he'll bring some of those perspectives about exploring innovation in a broad range of sectors uh, into this topic. Um, next, we have Tom Covert. Tom is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He studies investment behavior in energy markets with a focus on the role of regulation in determining the information incentives, the information and incentives available to energy producing firms. He's looking at how mandated information disclosure uh, affects the speed at which oil companies learn to use hydraulic fracturing uh, and their financial market performance. Uh, and he has degrees from both MIT and Harvard. Uh, and last, we have Danielle Lee. Um, she's an assistant professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management and a faculty research fellow at NBER. Uh, her research interests are in the economics of innovation, productivity, and organizational economics. Uh, and she's had a deep focus on the biomedical research and pharmaceutical fields. Um, and we learned just earlier today that we actually went to college together. She clearly did better in her courses and spent more time in academia. And you have more impact. <laughs> What's that? And you have more impact. We'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll compare notes a decade from now. Um, so, uh, so we're going to work our way back up uh, this way. And so we're going to start with, uh, we're going to start with Danielle. Um, so, um, we at ClearPath, who focus primarily on energy innovation, are very envious of the pharmaceutical and biomedical research field. Because if you look at sort of a percentage of government expenditure, there was a time when, these are round numbers, energy R&D was about 3x healthcare R&D. And over time, energy R&D as a share of total federal expenditures has steadily gone down, and healthcare research has steadily gone up. So now healthcare is about 3x energy R&D. And so I wonder, first, if you can talk a little bit about sort of how that has evolved in the space. Uh, second, what you think are particularly effective things in the space. And third, for I think the majority of us in this room who spend a lot of time thinking about energy R&D, if you can just basically give us the landscape of how uh, public-private interface in um, healthcare and, and sort of bio uh, R&D works. Um, and so what is the major role of the public sector there? And, and what do you think are the highest leverage parts of that? OK, sure. Um, so why don't I start out actually with the last question first to sort of set a stage for how, um, how pharmaceutical development um, works and how what the sort of the role of the public sector is in that. I mean, I should say that in some sense, we might expect uh, there to be so much funding for health because 
we have an aging population and you can invest in health if you're self-interested because you can immediately think, you know, this is going to help me, this is going to help my daughter, this is going to help my grandma. Um, whereas I think clean energy doesn't have that same incentive process. Um, so let me, um, let me start with some slides. Uh, okay. So um, just kind of a very quick primer for, um, for those of you in the audience. Um, U.S. spends roughly about $100 billion a year on biomedical research. It's about 40% kind of federal, state, nonprofit sources, and the remainder of that is coming from industry. Um, this is an area where the public sector actually plays a very large role. So if you think about FDA-approved drugs, 60% of them uh, directly cite NIH-funded work. Um, within sort of the public sector component of that, which is where I know a little bit more, um, the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, is by far the largest player. Um, obviously, it's an international um, effort, and so there's going to be money coming from Europe, coming increasingly from China as well. Uh, but the NIH is still sort of the world's single largest funder of biomedical research. Um, you look at basic science labs in the country, I would say about 80% of them rely on NIH funding in order to run. Uh, when you move further into kind of translational research, you start seeing a little bit more industry, uh, industry funding. Uh, so the way that the NIH works is that it's actually very bottom up. So you get congressional appropriations to the NIH Institute. So you know, National Cancer Institute gets some amount of money. National Institutes of Aging get some amount of money. Um, but at that point, most of the money is distributed through investigator-initiated awards, which is basically to say, if you think it's interesting, you submit an application, and we, we score it, we fund it. We, I mean, the funding rates are actually quite low, so I think you know, 85% of things will not get funded. Um, but primarily, it does not work as like a request for proposals. So it's, it's very, um, very much bottom up. And the way that I think about where this money has an impact on the world is, one, it creates um, what, we know, what sometimes people call open science. So it creates sort of like publicly available knowledge, so not invention, knowledge. Uh, that then is um, available to private sector um, consumers to use to, uh, to bring forth uh, in their products. The second, and this is actually really important, is uh, the training of scientists. So especially in pharmaceuticals, there are a lot, they employ a lot of PhD scientists. These PhD scientists are trained on grants supported by the NIH. It's um, extremely prevalent. It's very hard to get academic jobs in biomedicine these days, so most of these people will go out um, either into industry or it's sometimes into other fields. And so if you think about the, the workforce um, at, at like a Pfizer, for instance, that's, that's funded by the government. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we talk a little bit more now about sort of direct support for university innovation. I get an NIH grant. I invent something with that NIH grant. I'm allowed to, as the university to sort of have intellectual property on that, to license that, to commercialize that. Um, the reason I bring out these three things is that the third one is so I kind of listed them in what I roughly think of as the order of importance. The third one is the one that's measurable, basically. One and two are extremely hard to measure. And so I think one thing to think about in terms of advocating for, for R&D spending or just trying to understand the returns to R&D spending, uh, that's a really difficult question because the vast majority of where we think it has an impact is actually in the sort of um, amorphous way that's a bit hard to measure. Um, so I want to actually just kind of go through sort of um, an example of a success story in, in, in the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you can't read the particular graph. Um, so, the, uh, the, so one of, um, one of sort of the larger medical breakthroughs um, in recent years is the drug Gleevec. It, uh, it's actually been a little while now. It was approved by the FDA in 2001, and it was one of the first um, targeted cancer therapies. So typically when you think about sort of old school chemotherapy, what you do is you want to kill cancer cells. What do you do? You kill all the fast growing cells. And so when you do that, you're going to kill cancer cells, but you're going to kill hair cells. You're going to kill a lot of healthy cells. As a result of that, side effects are really bad, which means you can't make the drugs that strong. Uh, Gleevec is one of the first drugs that targets cancer cells in particular. So when you're killing cancer cells specifically, you don't get as many side effects. You can make those drugs stronger. Those drugs can be more effective. Um, and so there's two things. So basically, this graph is um, it's from, a pub, um, from an article in Nature a while back, and it's listing kind of the intellectual genealogy of Gleevec. And if you look all the way at the end, um, so like just the far side, that is sort of the New England Journal of Medicine article that publishes the trial on Gleevec. Gleevec gets approved by the FDA extremely quickly on the basis of that. 
Um, there are two kind of major lessons to take from this. The first is that private sector money only enters this graph like really, really far down the line, in the last you know, sort of few publications going through. Um, you can't quite read it, but this timeline goes you know, back to the 1960s. Um, it covers research on the genetics of cancer. Uh, it goes through the 70s, research on vascular disease. Um, and so this is, um, you know, we were talking earlier about kind of prizes and incentives and, and the role of the public sector. And one of the things that, you know, once you're kind of like, once that foundation of knowledge has been built, then you can kind of talk about, you know, how you want to sort of create the right prices or create the right prizes. But all that stuff before, it's basic research on like genetics of cancer. That's the kind of stuff that you cannot, like no price, no prize is going to make that happen. Um, and it's sort of the majority of a lot of these intellectual foundations that are there. And that money comes from the NIH. Um, some of it came from Britain. Some of it came from Italy. Um, and I don't think that these drugs kind of come without that foundation. The second thing to know, which was what makes funding, the public sector funding hard, is that it's hard to predict how it matters. So you know, if you funded this particular grant that created this publication in 1978, how do you know that 30 years later it's going to result in the, in the um, you know, in, in creation of Gleevec, which actually just really mattered for, for a lot of health. So lastly, I just kind of want to demonstrate that for you a little bit. Um, again, it's not really important to know exactly um, sort of the numbers on the graphs. But if you look at the, the first one, which is the one where the lines are very separate, um, the x-axis here is kind of, you imagine the year you get a grant is year zero, and the x-axis is just running time out. And the y-axis is the proportion of these grants that have been somehow associated with a private sector, with a patent. The lower line is these are patents that are accrued to the university. So this is what we say is like the direct production of innovation through publicly funded research. So this is the stuff that like kind of buy a dole allows us to um, support. And that's about like 10% of NIH funded grants, um, you know, going out 10 years are going to have one of these kinds of patents associated with them. The line that's much higher, this is sort of the open science channel. So this is the um, production of publications, so the output of academic science is primarily publications, the output of private science in the pharmaceutical sector is primarily patents, so you have to find a way to link the two. Um, so this is um, pat private sector patents that cite publicly funded research. So at that point, about 30% of NIH grants will produce a publication that is directly cited by a private sector patent. 30% is actually quite high. I was, I was surprised by how high that number was. Um, the next thing is that, just to look at the two graphs um, next to that, so it's sort of the same idea. Um, this is sort of the rate at which patents accrue to, um, to grants. Uh, the first, the middle graph is about all patents. Obviously, a lot of life science patents are just for molecules that turn out to do nothing. The next um, graph over there, the last one, is for patents associated with FDA-approved drugs. So this is the stuff that we really want. Um, and the one thing to keep in mind is those two lines, they're basically kind of overlapping. They're statistically very similar. And one of the lines is for research targeted for a particular disease, stuff that we think of as applied research. The other line is for stuff that we think of as basic research, so stuff that doesn't involve humans, doesn't involve diseases, doesn't involve any keywords associated with applications. And and so it's actually one of these things where, you know, we think of applied research as more likely to yield outcomes, but we're, that's actually not the case. Um, a lot of the sort of stuff that we label as basic ends up having a large impact. Um, and so I think one of the lessons to take from this is that, you know, it's, it's very hard to kind of target research and to understand where it's going to have an impact. Um, as a result of that, it makes it very hard to kind of advocate for, um, for funding because you can't say, you know, this is, this is where it's going to have uh, but the overall um, the overall rate is actually quite high. So um, I think that's a, a finding a way to sort of communicate that. I think I think it would be great. Great, thanks very much. Okay, so we're going to go down the panel and then we'll come back and um, discuss some of the cross cutting issues here. So um, so Tom, I think most folks would agree that you know the energy innovation of the 21st century, the thing that has moved the needle most, both for the United States and its sort of role, going from a climate of scarcity to a climate of you know, abundance, perhaps energy dominance, uh, is the shale gas revolution. And so uh, you study this area. Um, and I wonder, first, if you can sort of give us a bit of a landscape of just what the heck happened. Like, how did we go from sure. scarcity to abundance um, so quickly? Uh, and tell us a little bit about 
why yeah. um, you think that happened. And then last, uh, if you could describe a little bit about um, you know, specifically how you think those um, firms interacting in this space are approaching innovation in their sure. sector. Um, so I should first clarify, what I'm going to show you actually are going to be uh, figures relating to uh, oil production in, 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 in one of the plays in the United States that's big now in, in, in the Bakken of North Dakota. Um, I know you mentioned this as shale gas, but the, the thing, the stories we heard about shale gas early this morning mm -hmm. um, express themselves, you know, in much the same way in, in the oil sector as well. And in terms of characterizing what happened, um, uh, I, uh, I, I put together this first figure, which <laughs> illustrates pretty nicely, and unfortunately you can't see the bottom line very well. Um, <laughs> if you really squint, you should see uh, a yellow line uh, down at the bottom, which represents uh, the average output of wells in the early cohort of the expansion of uh, hydraulic fracturing technology in the Bakken Shale of North Dakota. Uh, and this is, this, this, uh, what, a, what a line on this figure here is, is the average output from a well in a given cohort uh, as it gets older, okay? So, you know, it starts off high, or it starts off, you know, moderately high in its, in its zeroth month, and then it peaks up a little bit in the, in the first month, and then it, it declines over time. And if any of you have seen uh, figures uh, similar to this from, from other plays, um, in the oil and gas space, this, this phenomena of high initial output and then a, a sort of a kind of an exponential decline is, is pretty standard in this space. What I'm, what I'm trying to show you uh, in the first thing this figure did to demonstrate what happened is two things. The first is that uh, the number of wells in a given cohort mostly basically grew over time. So it looks like this industry, uh, the industry, uh, the shale industry in North Dakota anyways, uh, got to be consider, uh, uh, continually uh, interested and aggressive in, in more, more extensively deploying uh, fracking technology over time. This holds, you know, so we see more wells per year and every year basically until 2015, which was a year in which oil prices were substantially lower than the year before. So one theme here is that uh, what happened was we just had a big, big increase in the number of hydraulic fracturing investments in this particular play. The second thing that, I, that you'll see, and I think this is perhaps the more important one, is that for the typical well in each of these cohorts, output seems to have gone up by a pretty sizable amount over time. And so if you compare basically where we are in the early cohort, so this is 2005 to 2007, uh, compared to where they were in the last cohort where we've got at least two and a half years of production data to look at, which is 2015, you're not quite, you know, at the, you're, you're in the ballpark of about 50% more output per well. And of course, this is on a base of a much larger number of wells, okay? So what happened was that uh, the industry drilled a lot more wells over time, you know, perhaps reflecting their, their confidence in, in their ability to use hydraulic fracturing technology, and they seems to have done it in a way that generated a lot more output per well. Okay? Now, why do we think uh, they were able to get uh, more output per well? This next slide here is going to sort of uh, demonstrate what I think is the most straightforward way of thinking about the three most obvious pieces that could go into additional output per well, some of which we might think about are, you know, Real, you know, real innovation, and some of these things are just going to just be straightforward applications of uh, basic engineering uh, knowledge. So what I'm showing in this figure here is, in the black line, the, uh, the average output in each of these cohorts, sort of if we were to discount it uh, uh, back to the, the start of the output for the, the, the start of output for that cohort, um, relative to the earliest cohort. So the earliest cohort, you know, does about as good as as, as, as it does, and as, 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 you, as, you move, as you move over time, you're seeing more and more output per well relative to that early cohort. My attempt here is to, is to try to decompose, decompose, decompose this growth in output into three pieces. The first is sort of like the most basic sort of uh, engineering phenomena you may have heard um, from this play, which is that uh, the, the industry went from drilling shorter uh, horizontal laterals to longer horizontal laterals, and that's what the sort of the green segment on the bottom basically shows. So of this sort of increase in output, um, a big piece of it can be explained very simply by the fact that they're in some sense drilling bigger wells. Okay, so there, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there's a ton of, uh, a ton of innovative uh, uh, expression there aside from the fact that there are some important engineering challenges in drilling longer wells. Um, and this is something the industry has certainly gotten better at. But that, 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 that factor of course plateaus over time because they reach the limits to how, how long a horizontal segment can actually get. The second piece, and this is something that you, you should expect to see in any play, is that where inside that play or oil companies in North Dakota chose to drill, of course, might be varying over time. And there's two ways to think about why that might happen. One is that uh, they already know ahead of time what are the good spots and the bad stops, spots, and they drill the good stuff first, and they eventually sort of move over towards bad stuff. Um, the second, uh, and not necessarily uh, you know, exclusive way of thinking about this, is they didn't necessarily know where were the good spots to drill. And over time, they sort of progressively figured that out. And so what the sort of the blue boxes 
or the, 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 the blue columns in each of these, in each of these uh, bars are showing, is that it actually turns out that relative to the early cohort, they primarily were drilling in better and better spots over time, with the exception of 2012. I don't have a great story for why we think 2012 was actually substantively worse than the other years. Uh, oil prices weren't so high that year that we would think that they were sort of really moving down their ability uh, to, to, to sort of profitably extract things. But it is the case that in 2012, it looked like they were drilling uh, worse wells than they were in the sort of earliest cohort. And what I think is sort of the most interesting piece of the why story here is, of course, is, the, is, is, is what we would think about truly as some kind of innovation here, which is changes in the composition of engineering choices that oil and gas companies in North Dakota made over time. Um, now, the reason why this figure is possible, by the way, is because regulators in North Dakota have such, uh, such careful uh, regulation documenting what firms have to disclose about um, the engineering choices they made, it's actually possible to sort of figure out uh, if these two wells are producing different amounts of oil, could we possibly attribute that difference in output to engineering choices made, uh, to differences in those engineering choices made uh, between firms. And so North Dakota, I think, is one of the, one of the states where this, we're, we're making a comparison like this is relatively easy. Uh, there are other states that have you know, as much or more oil and gas output than North Dakota does, but it's harder to make those kinds of comparisons in other states. So one thing I would sort of just interject into this discussion is, is, the, is, is the, the role that, this kind of, that, the, that the regulatory apparatus plays in creating the data that we can use to study this. So for, certainly from the perspective of studying it is really important. This figure, for example, is essentially not possible to make in, let's say, Pennsylvania. Okay. Now, that said, if you were actually were to look at uh, the, uh, the contribution of engineering choices uh, to this output growth, you can see that it's basically monotonically increasing over time. Uh, the latest cohorts have the biggest sort of engineering boost relative to the earliest cohorts. Uh, and I think that uh, that's pretty close to monotonic over time. Uh, and what, what, have I, what have I put inside engineering here? Um, the, the two things that, that at least the data suggests sort of matter the most are the quantity of uh, propent or sand that goes into these wells and the quantity of fluids, which is primarily water, but also the chemicals you, you often hear about. Um, and I'm, right now, what I'm, just, what I'm just sort of showing you is how much, how much we can explain uh, about this, the changes in output over time just by the quantities of those two things. And it does look like, primarily, just knowing those two things explains a huge fraction of the increase in output over time. Um, so to sort of come back to your question, um, you know, what happened here was a combination of I think uh, straightforward uh, engineering facts or straightforward uh, oil and gas industry institutions uh, that probably could have been known ahead of time, which is that you know we should we should try to figure out where are the right spots to drill. Uh, we should probably be drilling bigger wells to you know better amortize our uh, our, our investments in, in in the vertical segment of those holes. Uh, combined with something that we might think about as sort of a lot of uh, itsy bitsy small incremental innovation over time in making these better engineering choices. And so some of my research is, 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 is about trying to establish exactly how much of this sort of growth in, uh, in, the, in, in the engineering quality of these choices is because we have this publicly disclosed data that the firms themselves can learn from and how much of it is stuff that you might think about as being contained entirely within the firm. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, so Bill. Um, can you speak a little bit about the lessons you've learned uh, scaling up a clean energy innovation, but almost entirely without public sector support? And can you also share a little bit about um, what you've learned in the other sectors that you've taken a look at that you think could be applied to innovation in clean energy? Sure. Um, first of all, let me describe just briefly this alum cycle that Rich mentioned earlier. The alum cycle is a, is is a cycle that burns natural gas, captures 100% of the CO2, no other atmospheric emissions, and does it at a cost of electricity that is at or below existing combined cycle power plants. When we first told people that back in 2011, they looked at me like I was a snake oil salesman, that I was, I was positing something truly impossible. I came from Wall Street. I, I had a career, Goldman Sachs, AIG, Morgan Stanley, and many of my colleagues who had learned to respect me on Wall Street thought that Bill had gone nuts. And, um, and what was important about this was, was actually suspending disbelief in understanding that what is possible and what seems impossible could actually just simply be a reorganization of standard building blocks, standard Lego blocks, putting them together differently. And that was one of the traps that we found that, that happens in, in innovation, is that people are accustomed to thinking about the world in a particular way, 
and they're not willing or they, they, they tend to, there tends to be some sort of autocorrelation with past experiences. When we put Eight Rivers together, Eight Rivers Capital was put together back in 07 by a partner of mine, uh, and he and I went to MIT together, and, and his name is Miles Palmer, and Miles had spent his entire career developing weapon systems. Making, he, he worked with Teller, he worked with Lowell Wood, he was part of Star Wars. And every time I talked to Miles, he, uh, I would say, Miles, how's it going? And he would say, well, I can't talk about it. And, and finally, in, uh, in 07, we were together in New York City, and my cell phone wouldn't work. And I said, Miles, here we are in the largest city in the United States, and my cell phone won't work. And he looked at me with these earnest eyes, and he said, Bill, I know how to fix that. And I said, Miles, if you know how to fix that, we should start working on things like that, because Wall Street's getting ready to blow up. There were three events that had already happened uh, in 07. And you've been making weapons of mass destruction. I've been making weapons of financial destruction. Why don't we do good for a change? <laughs> if you look at what happened, uh, we, we originally organized ourselves. I, I thought that Miles would be the guy who invents things and I would be the guy who commercializes things and because Miles was a person working on defense systems and I was a person working on Wall Street and commercialized things and that would be a natural division of responsibilities. It ended up, two things happened. First of all, we brought defense industry scale to our thinking and we also brought Wall Street type techniques to our thinking. Not surprisingly, we came to this, this venture with things that we're, with which we're deeply familiar. Um, if you look at the structure of our business right now, it is very similar to a Wall Street trading floor. And here's how. Working on a Wall Street trading floor you need to know what's happening in, in Europe and China, in South America and, and the United States and Japan and China. You need to know what's happening politically. You need to know what's happening to the fixed income markets. You need to know what's happening to the equity markets. You need to know what's happening to the currency markets. You need to know what's happening to the commodity markets. Also on a trading floor, you have traders. You have structuring people. You have people who know how to put together options. You have, you have people who are trying to figure out the way the world works so that they can either make money opportunistically or so that to the extent that they're providing services to their clients, they know how to provide those services to their clients in a way that, that uh, distinguishes themselves from all their other competitors. Customers. Customers are out there. They're worried about the same things you're worried about, how the world works. But your customers rely on you for uh, helping them either take advantage of the way the world works or to protect them from the risks of the way the world works. And as you go out and visit your customers, your customers will tell you, I'm worried about this and this and this, and or I think there's ways of making money there and there and there. And in your own head, you, you pull these things together and you synthesize them in a way that you, in your own head, simultaneously you know about all the building blocks, all the little Lego blocks that are needed to put together to solve these problems. And as we put these things together, if you look at Eight Rivers, we're, not very, we're, we're very similar to a trading floor. We all sit close together. We all, we all bounce ideas off of each other. We're all talking to each other about opportunities. And, and to the extent that someone has an idea in one world, they cross it over into other worlds. As a result, today, we have, we have as Rich said, we work on, we're working on ballistic space launch. How do you get things into space without having to rely on the rocket equation to carry the fuel up with you? How can you get out of a tube fast enough to get into space without boost? That means you have to leave the tube going pretty fast. How do you think about solving the original problem that we looked at? How, you know, my cell phone doesn't work. Um, how do you get wireless speeds um, at fiber speeds wirelessly through the air? We're thinking about those things. Because if certainly 
We never thought that we never thought that that wireless phones would exist the way they are. Well, guess what? We think that that the speed of wireless communication should actually be the same as the speed of running something through fiber. And we know how to implement those. When we brought this to the energy space, if you think about it, we started out thinking about uh, it was the Recovery Act. The Recovery Act uh, from, from the Obama administration was what inspired us. We saw this line item in there for, for clean coal. And we started figuring we would solve the coal problem. And then we reached out and we, we found other people in the, and we did what I did on Wall Street. We went out to customers, we went out to big firms who had, who had highly paid people in their firms who had an idea, who had a lot of ideas that they thought needed, a lot of problems they thought needed to be solved. And they were also a source of inspiration. Pretty soon, our coal technology became we go to, to, to someone like Babcock and Wilcox, and Babcock and Wilcox says, we told them our, our value proposition. They said, give us three months to look at it. And they gave us three months to look at it. At the end of three months, they come back and they said, we've done heat mass balances. We've done computational fluid dynamics. We've done kinetics work. It all works. Don't start with coal. Start with natural gas. And because you should start with natural gas, we know exactly the turbine uh, uh, people you should talk to. You should not talk to GE. You should not talk to Mitsubishi. You should not talk to Alstom back then. You should not talk to Siemens. They're great companies. But one thing special about your cycle, it operates at high pressure. So you should talk to Toshiba. Toshiba, why? Because they, had, they were the farthest along in the world of steam dealing with Advanced ultra supercritical steam, high pressure. Now you start pulling all this together, and, and now you think about what the normal box of startups, what, what you do with startups. The world of startups changed after, after uh, the dot com era. And we have this lean innovation uh, 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 approach to, to creating new technology. Basically, you open up a shoebox, you throw a bunch of money in, and you throw some people in and close up the shoebox, and the people in that shoebox, they punch little holes in the bottom, and they go out in the market, and they iterate, and they take that money, and they spend iterating with a customer base. What is going to work? We took that shoebox, we flipped it. Instead of going down, we went up to strategics. We went up to the Exelons of the world. We went up to the, the Babcock and Wilcox of the world. We went up to every turbine vendor out there. And as a result of being able to, to bring their large amount of knowledge together and our ability to iterate on what they had, what they could provide us, we got tens of millions of dollars of free consulting. And we loved it when they said, this is wrong with this, that's wrong with that. We loved it because every time they said something was wrong, we knew that if we didn't fix it, we would fail. But if we did fix it, we were one step closer. So, Rich, that's the way that we, we've worked at, at, uh, at Eight Rivers, to really turn the whole world of startups on its head, to flip the box over, instead of being the traditional startup box, to create a box that actually uses the resources of established companies on a real-time, just-in-time basis. So that's our world. Pretty cool. So I want to talk to you in a minute about what lessons we could learn from that, either for other companies or for the public sector. First, though, I want to ask Daniel and Tom, you both talked a lot about the role of data. So you know, in your case, the fact that all of this North Dakota drilling information is publicly accessible and people seem to be learning from each other. And then you talked about you know the sort of three x productivity of sort of the you know um, open source kind of patents. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the choices that have been made, especially by the by the parts of that that are either regulated or funded by the public sector that required all of that, and how you think that that could be expanded or even better implemented, if at all? Um. Well, so as a, as, a, as, a, as a matter of sort of institutional facts, the, 
the rules that give rise to the, this data existing in North Dakota, in principle, exist in lots of states. So lots of states require oil and gas operators to say, you know, what they've done when they've drilled a 10,000 foot hole in the ground. Um, the way that those rules get implemented and then the way that data is collected and, and made available um, does vary across states. And I don't know that we should necessarily um, assume that the, the, state, the state of things in North Dakota where this data is you know, relatively uniform and accessible to roughly anyone who wants to get it with a, with a, little, bit of, a little bit of work um, was, a, was a super conscious decision. I mean, maybe, maybe it's the case that the, the other parts of the North Dakota regulatory apparatus outside of oil and gas regulation uh, operate this way. And you know, the regulators there have always just thought it important that if there was a form, it ought to actually be filled out. And we're going to follow you uh, if you don't do it. And we'll make those forms publicly available if they should be publicly available. Um, so I don't, I don't know that we should, we should assume that, that, that they had that intent uh, going into it. Um, that said, the fact that it's there is pretty useful. Um, uh, the fact that the shale revolution has taken place in other, in other states where these forms are not you know, as, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as uh, carefully collected and made, made public um, should give us a little bit of pause that, you know, the public, you know, that the spillover type story that I argue for North Dakota is the only story going on. Um, so, for example, Pennsylvania, you know, you, we can make similar graphs to the, the ones that, that I showed you here, you know, modular our ability to measure uh, the effects of en uh, engineering choices uh, in Pennsylvania and Texas, probably in Colorado, uh, probably in Oklahoma in the Woodford. Um, and uh, that doesn't, and, and I think what's probably going on there is there is some information spillovers. So they're just happening in a, happening in a, less, in a less formal fashion. Um, and so uh, whether or not we think that the formal channel of this information being made publicly available through a regulator uh, who keeps track of who has and hasn't disclosed um, is the most important of these things or just the sort of the natural state of the world in which um, you know, engineers talk to each other after work or uh, information is disseminated through service contractors, um, which is you know, going to be happening in most oil and gas plays. I don't, I don't think we know yet whether or not well, which of those two channels is more important. Um, but I would say that the fact that it is generally required to be disclosed uh, by all state regulators uh, suggests that the public you know, probably would benefit from it being you know, broadly, that, that principle being probably, broadly applied. So I think the data apparatus um, in, in pharmaceuticals uh, is actually not bad in the sense that the incentives are relatively well aligned. Um, so the way that the data I constructed came from is you have the NIH lists what grants it funds. It's available online. Um, it tells people, hey, if, you give, if we give you money and you do stuff with it, we want some credit. So it sort of asks people to um, report publications and report um, you know, thing, patents and things that have been supported by NIH funding. Incentives are well aligned there because if I get NIH funding once, I really want NIH funding in the future and I want to show that you know, I've done stuff. In fact, there's probably a lot of over-reporting where I just put random stuff um, onto that. And so from that, you can link um, you know, uh, grants to uh, publications. Uh, the patent record, um, typically patents cite other patents, and those are the citations that we talk about. But um, in a lot of sectors, patents also cite um, academic uh, prior art, so publications. Uh, that's all there. So um, you know, Google has it um, digitalized. It's the question of how you um, sort of pull out that data. And increasingly, actually, a lot of academic researchers have sort of done the dirty work um, of sort of going through all of the patent records and pulling out the specific kind of publication citations. The main piece that's harder is how you think about the sort of the people angle. So you know, when I when I get support uh, from a particular grant and this teaches me something and I go off into the private sector, that stuff is very difficult to trace. And I think that's actually kind of something that universities can be better at because they see, um, they see sort of the records for the postdocs and for the graduate students. Uh, universities are not always great at following where their graduates go. Um, having that information would be, uh, be really helpful. And I think, you know, one- Maybe we should connect the fundraising office with the, the scientific offices that sort of I mean, to really track people closely with the. I mean, I think that's, it's, it's actually in everyone's incentives because fundamentally, um, you know, the government does not fund science because we think science is beautiful. I mean, which maybe it should, but you know, we don't. We think it's, we fund it because we think it's going to be useful. The output of science is is publications and people. The stuff that we think of as useful are actually products. And then between sort of the, the publications and the people and the products, there's this big gap. And I think it really behooves sort of the institutions that benefit from this funding to sort of create that link to show you know, where that money is, um, is having an impact. 
I want to come back in a minute to this question about ROI. Um, but Bill, I understand you may have a different view on the role of disclosure sort of in the space, especially at the public-private sort of intersection. I wonder if you could share a little bit about that. Sure. If I asked everyone here how many have portfolios of investments that have had losses in them? Some people would raise your hands, and the people who didn't raise their hands would know that they did, they just didn't want to admit it, right? That's human nature. That is utter human nature. We want to say, we want to show our wins, but we want not to show our losses. That's what DARPA does. It didn't say ARPA, that's what DARPA does. They're able to show their wins, but their losses happen very privately. And because that's what happens with DARPA, DARPA can have a whole string of losses and all they have to do is show their wins. I would urge the same structure for ARPA-E. We unnecessarily hamper ARPA-E and the DOE and energy innovation by allowing our losses to be shown because that becomes the focus. And the losses drown out our wins. And if we do innovation really, really right, we probably should have one win and nine losses. Yet, the public cannot tolerate that. Yet, Congress cannot tolerate that. So, my proposal would be that we re-stand up RPE and basically put it behind a curtain. That basically, this innovation happens in private. And that the condition to doing this innovation, yes, we're, we've it run this somewhat like, a, like, the, like DARPA. And maybe they're two different streams. And maybe you sort of say, if we're doing the incremental work, the incremental stuff happens publicly. It's sort of more NSF, NIH type stuff. Or maybe, and then, but the really big, bold goals happen in private. And let us focus on celebrating our wins and understand that the people who, who manage this know that the losses can be internalized. So that would be the proposal. What do y'all think? Um, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think I think I think a, a way a way of agreeing with that statement would be to say that um, it's easy for a big uh, monolithic organization uh, to learn from its own failures. Um, so they get to internalize uh, both uh, the benefits of the win because they get because maybe they've developed something that other people can't copy, and they have a little bit of market power as a result, and they can you know they they can pay back. Um, they can pay back their investors for the R&D they funded, uh, but they can also see what didn't work and not do those things again. Um, and what's challenging, uh, certainly from a public perspective, and I think what will be challenging um, in an industry in which you don't have a small number of monolithic players, um, is that those lo the, the facts that arise from those losses are very useful public information uh, for everybody, whether they are big, um, you know, sky-high attempts at a leap, or small uh, incremental progress towards you know designing a better hydraulic fracturing completion. Um, those things that uh, those things are things that I think every company would prefer to keep uh, a secret because you know if they do figure out something that's bad and their competitors are going to waste time on it, that's good for them. If they figure out something that's good, um, they don't want to tell their competitors how it worked. Uh, they ought to. They also want to sort of have that advantage. I think that not sharing those, I think not sharing, not sharing failures means that failures happen way too many times, uh, and probably not as many people get to learn uh, from why failures actually happened. Um, I don't know. I, I guess there's there's a bit, there's a bit of the same kind of phenomena in in medicine where a, where failed clinical trials don't always get reported, that, you know, entirely, and so maybe that maybe. You have something similar to say. Yes, I, was, I, I completely agree with you on this. The, I mean, so I see the political like angle, sort of the Solyndra thing, um, and everyone just kind of focuses on that. Um, 
so in pharmaceuticals, it is more public because clinical trials do have to be registered. And so phase one failures, phase two failures, you know, they're, they're, they're public. Um, so there's like a little bit of you can maybe hide it a little bit. For the most part, they're public. And so, um, you know, I have, a, I have a colleague that studied it. And what you find actually is when there are these sort of phase two failures of drugs. So um, phase two is where you're sort of, you sort of first get the information about whether or not the drug is going to have some efficacy for the particular disease. Phase one is primarily for safety. Um, you see other firms react. You see them if they're uh, in the same, um, if they're in the same sort of broad market, like they want to treat the same disease area, they might be excited because now there's going to be one fewer competitor. But if they're in the same technology class, so if they're looking at the same kind of target uh, mechanisms, you've learned a lot and you see resources get redeployed elsewhere. And I think that that really is very valuable. And one thing I would say from pharmaceuticals is that, you know, a lot of pharma drug failures are, are quite common in the sense that, you know, you know there was going to be some, uh, you know, new sort of version of a statin and it's failed, or this new cancer drug doesn't work. We don't, like, the public doesn't get mad about that in the way that I felt like the public got mad about some of these kind of government Solindra, funding yeah, exactly. and cylindro type things. Yeah. Like, you don't have that same, like, torch, like, the mob coming kind of thing. And so I don't think it's... <laughs> I don't think it's nest it's like But there's a reason. Because these are fundamentally different worlds. Because the public does not want because as you said, drugs are personal. Right? And so failure, knowing about failure actually protects the human. And so yes, they want to make sure that in the world of pharmaceuticals and the drugs that those don't happen to them. However, energy is is very different. We think about your PhD thesis. Someone does not submit a PhD thesis where they think there is a 99% chance of failure because they won't get their PhD. They, tr they submit their thesis because their objective is to, get, is to succeed, is to get their PhD. Think about grants. Think about the times because the reaction functions that we have, we actually, we actually reward reaction functions for incrementalism and we don't reward reaction functions for, uh, for things that have a high likelihood of failure, but could be dramatically uh, uh, change the world. And so the, the question is, how do you create something? Because I will tell you, there's a very big difference between what happened in our world. We did it private sector. Why? Because it, was, it would be impossible to do what we did for all sorts of reasons with government. We had to do private sector. Yeah, it just makes me think about a spin in the sense that you know you can take a failure and you can say oh you know we wasted this money this has to do with this like, giant apparatus that's unaccountable or you can think of it as we tried this particular technology and we realize it doesn't work now we can focus our efforts on something else but and more to the point then that is a fact the thing, this, this hypothesis we had that this particular thing would do this thing did not actually work that's knowledge that other people can build off of right mm -hmm. yeah and I wonder if maybe it's like some of the political like you know if you're sort of for this funding you can view it one way if you're against this totally, funding, yeah. you can view it the other way and, and sort of that brings the politics kind of back in like via the rhetoric, which I think is, yeah. like if there's a better, if there was a way for us to communicate the value of failure, I mean the vast majority of R&D is failure. And if we view it as failure rather than learning, then I think it just makes it kind of harder to sort of spend money that way. We do not have innovation at the bottom 85% of the pyramid. We only have innovation at the top 15% of the pyramid. In, and you don't know where US it sector. is, like where the 85 percent, at least in pharmaceuticals, I mean like one percent like of drugs gets through, but you don't know like at the time you make the investment <laughs> which one it is. I mean most medical spending is like so a large amount of medical spending is wasteful, but we don't know like which part of it is the waste. But capital um, intensive, we don't fail on. Okay. We, this is where, this is, this is the problem. Capital intensive, any time that you need 500 million dollars to run an experiment, I mean look at what we did, look at what we did. Our experiment in Texas cost us $160 million. That was, that was serial number zero. There's no way that, we, that anybody's going to put a, write a $160 million check to, except for the private sector. And for us, even in the private sector, we could not go into the middle of a corporation and say to, the, to someone in the VC part of a corporation, oh, write us a $160 million check. Well, they would say, well, my job, if I fail, my job is toast. You had to go to the CEO. You have to go to people who can take that risk and who can weather that risk and who can manage that risk. And what we've done is we've set up a world where that, those checks never get written. And the only place we went is the private sector. Now, great for us, we're able to execute. But no one else can do it. 
Yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're probably not in that much of a disagreement. A, 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 way, of, a way of synthesizing uh, what you just said in, in the language that, that Daniel and I often use is that uh, if you had, let's say, failed on the $150 million check, it's probably not that you went back to a state of the world where you knew nothing. You just knew that some of the things that you tried didn't work, and you, know, you now understand some of the engineering phenomena better, and you can do something better with the next $150 million check. And you probably don't want to share that information with other people because you put the $150 million down and not you know, society writ large. And I think that that's actually a, a, pretty, you know, a, pre, a pretty reasonable thing, a, pre, a pretty reasonable approach to thinking about public disclosure is that uh, if you're going to do it entirely privately, um, there's a sense in which you, you, know, you, you might want to keep some of that. Uh, the only point that we're trying, to, we're trying to make is that in general, there are going to be some, some spillovers from both successes and failures. Um, and right now, right now, I think what you're basically describing is that uh, we should allow those, we should allow spillovers for failures, I mean, for for successes, and monetize and allow and allow the people who get those successes to you know monetize some of that success through the patent system. And it's just there are going to be other there are going to be other circumstances inside energy where the oil and gas uh, sector is, I think, the, the most obvious one, uh, where it's it's going to be hard to protect that sort of successful idea with a patent. Um, and so you're going to have to you're going to you're going to have to basically accept that. Uh, a, a new idea is going to get is going to get copied if it turns out to be good, and in that case, you probably would rather actually be able to have access to everyone else's new idea at the same time. Yeah. I mean, okay, I'm going to ask Daniel one more question, and then we need to turn it over to the audience. So, um, valuation of R and D ROI. Mm -hmm. So, as an advocate, uh, I am sort of forced to rely on anecdote. Yeah. Right? We have these five great examples of the successes of the Department of Energy, and those things paid for every dollar that's, that's ever come out. Uh, in fact, I've never actually done the math to determine whether those five things yeah. really have paid for every dollar spent at, at mm -hmm. DUA. I, th I think they would, round numbers. Uh, but it would be quite helpful to have that multiplier yeah. to say, on average, a dollar goes in that when adjusted for all these failures, yeah. you know, enough. You know, so uh, clearly we've talked a lot about the difficulty of coming up with that multiplier. Um, mm -hmm. But I wonder if you've given that thought and yeah. you know, how you would approach doing something like that. Yeah, so there, I think there are sort of, um, especially for sort of the public funding angle, like three major challenges. So the first is sort of a traceability issue where you, know, you put money in one day um, and it can, the problem is so like public, private funding, mostly you fund something because you think it's gonna produce something. So you just imagine like a factory where you buy an extra input, you get an extra widget. You know where to look. The whole point of a large amount of basic science is that we don't know where to look. And we, we sort of throw this stuff out there and we kind of let, let it be what it is. Because of that, it makes it extremely hard to trace because it's diffuse. And at the time we make the investment, we don't know where to look. So creating some of this data infrastructure ends up becoming very important. The second thing is sort of this thing that economists like to think a lot about, which is the difference between correlation and causation. So you know, if you um, put a lot of money into an area that's booming and more people are doing um, research in that area, you see this positive correlation, but is it actually causal? Um, and that's something where I actually think that funders need to be more open about kind of doing more experimentation in terms of let me just kind of give more money to this area and kind of understand what the effect is. I think a lot of people don't want to truly know the effect. like the, how well they do, they don't want to really grade themselves, and that prevents a lot of that work from being done. And then with the, um, the public sector stuff, you also have to kind of think about crowd out, where you know, if, you, if you put this money in, is that money that's increasing the total pot of innovation in the world, or are you just paying for something that the private sector would have paid for in the absence of that funding? So I looked at this for the NIH, um, and you know, obviously all these, all these types of things require assumptions. Um, and I'm happy to talk kind of offline about it. I would say a fairly conservative estimate is that for every dollar of NIH funding, you get 1.4 to about $2 worth of drug sales. So this is revenues associated with patents like for approved drugs. This is not counting the value of training. This is not counting the value of learning things about like bacteria so that we wash our hands. It's not counting the value of medical devices. Um, I think these returns are high. Uh, and I think sort of being able to you know, I don't really, well, 1.4 to, you know, you can sort of fuss about these numbers. Um, but the thing is that numbers are helpful. Um, and yeah. Yeah, numbers, good. Um, OK, uh, let's take questions from the audience to the extent that we kept people awake. Hi, my name is 
name is Anais Borja, and I work for Representative Scott Peters. So um, I want to ask the panel. So imagine you uh, staff a member of Congress who sits on a committee with jurisdiction over energy and environment policy, and your boss asks you to come up with uh, a way to spend $4 billion a year. This is not based on reality, but let's <laughs> say you get a couple of billion a year. What are three ways to spend it? And more importantly, what are three complementary re regulatory reforms to go along with it to sort of maximize that investment? Let's start here. I think we have already shared our views directly on uh, this topic. So, any, anybody else? Uh, I mean, if you, um, it, it depends on depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If 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 your uh, if your if your goal is something um, sort of sky high thinking, like we're going to reduce we're going to reduce carbon emissions, I think that the basic research behind uh, things like battery technology, um, I think that uh, rethinking the regulations around um, Things like transmission siting, for example, um, and uh, and also rethinking uh, how we have a whole bunch of overlapping policies that don't necessarily uh, complement each other really well uh, would be a good a, a good way to put it all together. I don't, to be honest, I don't study batteries, uh, so I don't know if four billion dollars is a lot relative to how much goes into a battery R and D right now, or if it's a little bit. Um, but I would probably put it towards some notion of uh, storage investments plus those kinds of deregulations. It would be a lot. Four did billion in batteries would be a lot. You, did you say four billion? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Four billion. I think that small the R and D is important. I think the biggest hurdle that we are facing is getting project number one built. And project number one, getting people over that hurdle for project number one is is hard. And that's where the Recovery Act, I think, was helpful. I thought it was a great idea, although what I would have preferred to see, and as you see, a lot of those projects in the Recovery Act never ended up completing. And what would have been better is if they made that, that fund, that pile of fund, evergreen, so that it stayed there. And in addition, that that fund would take implicitly some level of equity interest in the things that they funded to help for the successes to fund back into that fund. That, I think, I think that would change a lot. And because it would give the government, it would give the government some sense that, that we're, we're doing the bold thing. It would give, it would align the U.S. populace with the success, uh, with the successes and say, and yes, those successes are paying back into this fund. I think it would create a, a virtual cycle. Hi, I'm Ellen Williams, uh, former chief scientist of BP and former director of RPE. In about an hour, I will be putting up some success metrics for RPE. So uh, I don't think that the successes at RPE need to be kept behind a curtain. I, I was profoundly bothered by the discussion of successes and failures uh, that we were having up, up front there. So I'd like to just maybe make a couple of comments. First of all, Solyndra was not an RPE project. It was a loan pro program object. Uh, office project. The Loan Programs Office does fund big projects, or did, I don't know if they still exist, um, at the hundreds of millions of dollars level. And in fact, they're su uh, profoundly successful in doing so in returning money to the U.S. Treasury. Cylinder happened to be a failure, and it was very much publicized for political reasons, but it certainly was not a um, example of the failure of the Loan Programs Office or the concept of government funding of advanced technology. And at the earlier stages of R&D, I think it's very, it's extremely unuseful to talk about failures. Uh, this is, um, early stage R&D is not like a drug trial where you really are testing a particular product for its uh, efficacy. Earlier stage R&D is really has to be about exploration of lots of areas in research. And the way that research works is that there are many people working on many strands of uh, investigation, all of which build a body of information which contribute to the whole. And so I will show you later some success metrics for RPE. And when I show those success metrics, people would always say to me, oh, but that's only 60% of your projects that you have on these success metrics. What happened to those other 40% that were failures? And I said, those were not 
failures. Those projects ran, they met their milestones, 10% do fail and fail to meet their met milestones, get canceled, but those 40% ran, they met their milestones, they contributed to common knowledge, they trained students, they trained uh, people to be contributing members to go out and, and further develop technology. So when you're talking about early stage R&D, it's profoundly disruptive and incorrect to talk about failures if something failed to I don't know what your metric for success is uh, to, to immediately generate a commercial output. So please be careful with, with making a distinction with, about what you're talking about in terms of the stages and the types of technology development because this is just not a useful thing to stand up and say failure. I learned at BP that when I went and talked to my chief executives and I wanted to talk about risk and the fact that some of the projects were gonna fail, that was not a word I could say. I could not say that some of the projects were gonna fail, I, but I could talk about the ones that would succeed and understand that the rest of the process is not a yes or no, fail or win situation. It is a process of developing the fundamental set of knowledge that's essential to make progress happen. You know, I'm, I'm gonna build on one point uh, that Ellen made, in, actually in response to your question about what should be done. There's a significant institutional problem at the Department of Energy, especially around some of these big cost share projects which have been characterized as failures, right? So take the Kemper County pre-combustion, you know, gasification carbon capture project, right? That has become the, you know, the white elephant, right? The albatross around the neck of carbon capture as a technology. Viewed another way, one could say, well, we always knew that there were three ways to do carbon capture. You could either do it on the front end of the system or the back end of the system or do what Bill's done, integrate it into the system. And Kemper County showed us that it's actually not really a good idea to do it on the front end of the system. And the billions of dollars around the rest of the world that were lined up around doing gasification technologies, they should all just be redeployed to the stuff on the back end of the system or to integrate it into the system. And that's actually a really useful learning. It's really hard to uh, produce the report that says that in the sort of the tough tension and wake of you know, everything that was characterized and in the press that was shown to have you know, gone wrong about that project. Uh, but one thing I would suggest is that there's a dedicated fund and, and analysis that sort of goes in and there's a team who kind of does the, uh, whatever you call it, the autopsy on these projects and produces the positive learnings that come out of every one of these projects. Because it's actually very difficult to get the people who were working deeply on them, and to Bill's point, many of whom are now embarrassed or feel that their careers are in some way at risk because of it, uh, to do that sort of thing. Um, and it's very difficult to get um, you know, the department, for example, to devote a lot of resources there. So I think that would be a very high leverage use of even a small pool of funds in analytics. Well, even on the loan program there. office, if you, look, if you take an actuarial uh, rating of the loan program office, that whole thing is a single A-plus uh, entity, which, which illustrates the problem. It should not be a single A-plus entity. It should be something, <laughs> should be something totally different. But they're looking for success and not failure. Now, now failure and success also is, is, in my view, in my view, failure is, success is, is one half a degree. That's success. Anything short of half a degree in, impact on the climate, I'm just telling you, for me, that's failure. I need, we need to have, I, we, the bold goals that we define for ourselves at Eight Rivers, it's that big. And anything short of that is not satisfactory. And if we can't do something like that, we don't touch it. I mean, so one thing I would say is that I think it might be helpful to think of these things not as the success or failure of individual projects, um, especially at the later end, but to think of them as portfolios. Um, and you, when we think about things as portfolios, you think about, you know, like, it, the more diversified you are, the more idiosyncratic risk you can hold. And in some sense, if you look at like venture capital, sort of straight up regular, like the kind of venture capital that funds like Candy Crush or Tinder or something like that, these funds, um, you know, they report as they report the results as funds. Seventy, like seventy-five percent of Series A investments lose money. They know this going in. The idea is that right. you know you 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 fund all of this stuff, you incentivize these people to take risks, so that one of them kinds of ends up getting a. Uh, ends up doing well. This is why actually I think mean, a lot of small biotech firms are able to take a lot of risk, not because small firms are just inherently like innovative and exciting, but because they're backed by funders that have incentives to push them to take these risks because they understand kind of the math of the portfolio, not of the individual thing. And I think that, you know, 
at that view, it might be more useful to think about. Do we have other questions? So just to kind of crystallize, uh, you guys kind of each talked about, I think, uh, a handful of ideas and kind of focused on one or two, but uh, the panel is lessons from other industries. So what would be your one or two things that you think, um, you know, if you look if you look at life sciences or you look at fracking uh, or Bill, if you look at your process overall in your portfolio, like what are the one or two things that you think uh, the energy innovation space potentially could benefit from thinking more like the success stories that you guys have talked about? Well, I, that's the reason I brought up the, the financial sector. I mean, we should think of running it much, much more, like, more like a bank or a trading world where you're actually bringing in opportunities, understanding a world, matching them together with your tools. The other piece about that, the corollary to that, is that we do not do anything unless you can model it to a fairly well on a computer. We never ever, that's why we don't do life sciences. We never ever start in space unless you can do heat and mass balances, kinetics, uh, computational fluid, unless you can do it all on a computer and, and then you can sort of take it into the field. I mean, think, the 787 was 100% designed on a computer. And so that's, that's our, our filter function. Can, can I just make a comment on that, which is um, there's been significant discussion uh, in the nuclear space about sort of getting more input from the buyer community of those technologies as opposed to the reactor developer community of those technologies sort of into the process earlier. And as you described that, Bob, that really crystallizes for me that that is just absolutely essential. The idea that we would be have DOE spending a lot of time with people who have a, have a widget as opposed to the people who actually would buy that widget down the road some you know, decade in the future and understand exactly what that person wants out of it, as opposed to the person who's got this brilliant idea that, you know, who knows whether that's ever actually commercializable, that crystallizes the value of something like that for me. Um, as far as fracking goes, the ways to generalize that outside of the oil and gas space, um, I already talked about one, which was this, the importance of, um, of, a, of a decent regulatory apparatus to collect data on uh, the engineering choices these companies have made and to make it somewhat publicly available. Uh, the other thing that I didn't get a lot of uh, time to talk about, but I think is also equally important, and it probably actually presents a challenge for generalizing these results, is that the industry structure in the uh, United States onshore oil and gas sector has an enormous, you know, ridiculously fat tail of small, small companies that are trying uh, all sorts of basically uh, idiosyncratic things. Uh, that is what makes it possible for uh, these sort of uh, small incremental improvements to add up to sort of the big the big effects we saw in those slides, um, and uh, you know the fact that the U.S. onshore space looks different uh, than the you know the offshore space or uh, the oil and gas sectors in other countries has has some interesting institutional history. But uh, you know one thing one thing that I, that I would say uh, would be nice if we could generalize it, and I don't know if that's going to be true, is uh, to actually try to imagine ways that uh, policy uh, or the finance community. Uh, can make it possible for lots of smaller companies to try, you know, legitimately, you know, crazy ideas on, uh, you know, crazy relative to the size of their capital base type budgets. Um, uh, that would be like the sort of the most direct uh, uh, application of what was, you know, what we probably saw in the fracking revolution. Can, can I ask you on that? Uh, Melanie earlier in the day described a bit about what the Department of Energy did along with the Gas Technology Institute and to some extent the Alternative Production Credit, what all of that did for George Mitchell when he sort of initially pioneered these yep. technologies. I wonder, do you have any further comment on kind of that the, the storyline that Melanie laid out or sort of the, the earlier days? You know, so most of my was? research sort of starts in North Dakota in the mid-2000s, so uh, it's kind of after, after uh, um, the DOE and the, and the GTI uh, had, had, in, had invested in developing these ideas. Um, in, in gas shell plays. I will, I will emphasize that it was not actually the case that that idea was one you could literally just copy and paste and make it work correctly in North Dakota or in the Eagleford um, or in other gas shales that were similar to the Barnett. Um, so there, there is some sort of role for, I don't know, follow-on development, if you want to call that, or uh, follow-on learning. Um, but, um, you know, obviously there's going to be some, you know, some, some part of the public sector sh certainly deserves credit for for encouraging people like George Mitchell and some of the scientists who worked in, at the DOE at the time to actually try these ideas. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that. 
Um, I see. So I think maybe two two like potential lessons. So one on the uh, kind of the basic funding angle, the uh, the idea of being able to sort of communicate clearly um, and identify sort of where uh, basic science has an impact. Uh, you know, is there like a particular technology? Because health is really good at coming up with like, you know, this is a baby that would have died had it not been for this. And I think that that ends up actually being quite galvanizing. And if energy could have a way to communicate something kind of similar to that. Um, on the sort of the development end, I think uh, it's useful to think about what institutional organizational levers we have to change people's risk appetites. I think one of the sort of success points in pharmaceuticals has been in kind of biopharmaceuticals, biologics, these kind of like fancy gene therapy type things, where you know there are a lot of these small firms um, that are able to take a lot of risk because of sort of I think a lot of the, the venture capital backing it, uh, creating this portfolio that allows them to sort of bear it idiosyncratic risk. Um, and then there being an exit market. So most of it is that these companies, uh, they, they want to get spot by one of these larger companies. So it's like very active kind of acquisition space. Um, and that creates kind of a, a fairly shorter term um, uh, like possibility of profit. So you know you don't have to, like the path from a particular drug all the way through FDA approval is actually quite long. But to the point where you can sort of prove out your hypothesis enough that someone else will buy you um, and carry you forth. Uh, create sort of these these shorter term incentives that get people to sort of be able to see the finish line as they're doing that research. Do we have any other questions? Hi, Bill Hederman, Penn. Uh, I have a question for Bill. Bill, the funding for your activities. Um, must be patient money, if you will. I'm not sure about how flexible it needed to be. But I, it wasn't clear to me whether it was mostly the members of your team self-funding or you had found other communities of uh, money for that as well. I was wondering if you could talk to that. Sure. Um, we started out with VC because it was there and we thought that was the obvious place to go. Um, and we realized that VC was, had tried to do clean tech in 08, 09, and, and it, it, uh, it failed miserably. Uh, and the reason it failed, if you, if you look at it, before the dot-com era, VC was, they did have domain experts. And they did invest in, in places where they had expertise. And so you might have a chip VC, you're investing in chip companies. And, and so you had all these, these domain experts, and these domain experts were also there not just to put money with you, but also to help coach you. And dot-com changed all that because they, they made, basically made the cost of developing something a uh, million dollars worth of pizza. You know, and, and so, um, and so we, we realized that, that and when it turns into a million dollars worth of pizza and you've got a billion dollar fund, um, you basically have to do, uh, you at least do probably 200 investments, right? Once you hit 200 investments, there is no way that you can have let your domain expertise guide you. And there's no way that, there's no filter function. So what had to happen is the filter function had to implicitly, if you want to be very cynical about it, the filter function was outsourced to the teams who started the startups. Why, and that's why the VC funds say, what's, what is it, team, team, team? They're basically putting their money with people who've proven that in the past that they, that they could make good decisions and they're agnostic as to what they vote on. Now they pretend, they pretend that they actually have the domain expertise, but they're basically outsourcing this, you know, throwing a, you know, 200 pieces of spaghetti up against the wall and they're saying, listen, we'll throw it to 200 people who've already done this in the past and so we're outsourcing our decision making. We had to find, but for us to work in the old style VC model, for us to work, we needed domain expertise. And the only way we could find our domain expertise was going in to, for instance, within Exelon, we went into the CEO. Uh, for you know, the other companies, we went into the CEO. Uh, and the CEO then appointed people in their own organizations to vet us. So we, we had to accept that the VC model was broken we had to get someone who could provide us with the domain expertise coaching. And we assembled, in effect, 
on the fly an old style VC firm, which we sort of made it out of whole cloth. And we found that very effective. Uh, what we did do at the beginning, uh, at the beginning it was Miles and myself, we sort of wrote our own checks for the people who started, but we very quickly knew that to scale this up, we needed large uh, strategic partners. I think we have one more. Do we have time for one more? Is that okay? Hi, I'm Rick Jordan, uh, Swasburg Jordan Consulting. I'm the Jordan of the Consulting, so it's a small firm. But this is to you, Bill. Um, you mentioned on the uh, alum cycle, supercritical CO2 work, that you went to Babcock and Wilcox Logical Company to go to. They studied for three months, came back with an idea to go to Toshiba, and you said you got million, millions of dollars of free consulting work. How did you pull that off? Yeah, it's, um, we have this rule internally. We have, we have three filter functions for whatever we do. The first filter function is that we have to be able to do, what, you know, do our, our design using computers because otherwise it costs money to go out and do things on things other than computers. Um, the second filter function is is that we had, it had to be in our space where we know what we're talking about. At least we had the, some level of domain expertise. And by the way, for domain experts, we have to have, uh, within Eight Rivers, we've curated what I'll call autodidactic polymaths. Um, and the reason is, if the world's problems could be solved by domain experts, we would have no problems because there's no shortage of domain experts. What we had to do is we had to find domain experts that could jump into another area. And that's been a really valuable thing, is to take uh, expertise out of one domain and then grow it into another domain and sort of look for cross-pollination across domains. The third filter function, though, is what we call the three comma rule, as in a billion dollars. And there, we have to have a billion dollars of revenue, have line of sight on a billion dollars of revenue in five to 10 years. And because you have line of sight on a billion dollars worth of revenue in, th in, three, in five to 10 years, you can get into the C-suite of any corporation on earth. That's what gets you over the hump. That's what allows you to get access to people. That's what allows you to inspire someone's imagination. And all you need is one CEO that wants to fund that. And that also goes back to my, my days on Wall Street because that's sort of what I did on Wall Street, figure out how to get a CEO to take my call. But that was that combination and it's, and, but we stumbled into it. It wasn't planning. We just did, Miles and I just did what we normally did and it sort of worked. And, and then we looked at, you know, post, post mortem, that we were just doing what we knew how to do. Okay, please join me in thanking our panelists for a really interesting discussion.